Something up. Why was it a terrible mistake? Because you look something up, you find so many different opinions about what that ever did, you're dizzy. I, I looked up to see, because there was one thing I wasn't sure about that I wanted to tell you today, and I wanted to tell it to you correctly, so I looked. And I found a bunch of versions, not just of that, but many other things. So I'm going to tell you what I remember. I just want you to know that when someone wrote a diary, then, at the time that the events happened, and I come along and I give you a different version, probably what is written in the diary is correct. And what I'm saying is incorrect. Not because he's smarter than me, because he wrote a Bishas Maise. You know, memory is a funny thing. Especially since I wasn't by one Tkiyas of the Rebbe, I was by so many. My earliest memories of Tkiyas, I was seven or eight. Seven or eight. My last memory of Tkiyas, I was 26 years old. It's, it's about 20 years. And I wasn't always there, but I, I probably was by the Rebbe 15 years for Tkiyas. For sure, 50, maybe almost, if not 15, 14. I'm so blessed, I'm so lucky. My father had such good seats. We were able to see almost everything. And gosh, could we have behaved better? I, that's all I have to say, we could have behaved better. Oh, we. I told you last time about how Rabbi Katz would announce, where you're standing and in front of whom you're standing. That plays in my head not once a year, but like five times a day. The Rebbe B'chalal knows everything. What happens in his Dalai Lama is he for sure knows. And there were a lot of things that happened in the Rebbe's Dalai Lama that the, the Rebbe was not particularly happy about. He, he, he accepted it. To some extent, the Rebbe accepted the pushing. But when it turned from pushing into fighting, the Rebbe, you know, once the Rebbe came in like a quarter to 11, and Yom Kippur morning, came in almost an hour late, because when he came to show in the morning, they told me that the women had a fight. And one woman put another lady in the hospital. And the Rebbe said that a woman has to go to the hospital and apologize. And he's not coming down till she returns and came and reports back that she apologized and that the lady accepted her apology. The Rebbe came in almost an hour late because the Rebbe heard about a fight. Now, the Rebbe knew about the fights whether he heard about them or not. But when you told him, it was different, you know. But we could have behaved. We could have remembered. Vi mishtait nefavem mishtait. Anyway, let's talk about Tkiyas. I, the last thing I told you, I, I listened this morning, was about the, the sefetere. That people pay tens of thousands of dollars to have the right to do hagva. And a whole year they didn't bother. If you paid for it, somebody else can do hagva galila. But if you did hagva galila, you got to stand mamish next to the Rebbe, Bishaz the Tchiyas. The big sefetere, which was called Bashir sefetere, was to the Rebbe's right, on the Kingston side. And the small sefetere, which was on the Rebbe's left, on the Eastern Parkway side, um, was on the Rebbe's left. So the Rebbe would say the maftir and the haftero. And after the haftero, the Rebbe would turn around and the two svarim would come uh, forward. Now, did I tell you about the being, the being a makri or not? Did I tell you that thing or not? About somebody reading the tki out loud with the Rebbe or not? That's a negative, right? There's a halach and shulchan That when a person blows shayfer, it's like when a koyen duchens. When a koyen duchens, the chazan is supposed to say the words before, right? Why is the chazan supposed to say the words before? So the koyin shouldn't make a mistake. In all of my years of experience, the koyin never makes a mistake, the chazan often makes a mistake. But the chazan is there to tell the koyin what to say, the koyin shouldn't say the wrong word. The same halach applies by tchias. When you blow to blow shoifar, somebody else is supposed to stand next to the baltekeya and he says loud, tchia, shvarim teruah, tchia, tchia, shvarim, tchia, and then the baltekeya blows. In Chabad, the minig is not to say it out loud, but you point with your finger. So there's a difference when you're the makri by a regular minion, and you're the makri if the Rebbe is the one reading, blowing the tkiyas. If you're the makri and a regular guy is blowing, in other words, someone in show is blowing, and you're standing next to him, so you point at the tkiyah, he blows the tkiyah. When you take your finger off the tkiyah, he stops. When you put your finger on the shvarim, he blows the shvarim. You take your finger off the shvarim, he stops. But when the Rebbe blows shoifa, you don't want to tell the Rebbe how long the sounds should be. So when the Rebbe blows Tkia, the Makri has his finger on the Shvarim, the next one. When the Rebbe blows Shvarim, he has his finger on the Trua. When the Rebbe blows the second Tkia, uh, the, the second Trua, he blows on the you're one ahead of the Rebbe. Now there is an uncertainty about whether the Rebbe Bechlal had a Makri. It's conceivable that the Rebbe did both things himself. It's also possible, and I was never able to ascertain this with a certitude, that Rabbi Shmuel Levitin, who was a very great chassid, a very special chassid, who the Rebbe had a very unusual relationship with, called Rabbi Shmuel, Rabbi Shmuel Levitin. And some people say, he, he was a levy, he always got levy. Some people say that he was the makri. Some people say that he wasn't. 
The bottom line is, Epshmuel passed away in 1974, Tafshin Lamed So for sure, Lamed Hey, Lamed Rav, Lamed Zayin, 74 to 75, 75 to 76, and 76 to 77, the Rebbe did not have a Makkah, he did both. The year of the heart attack, yet Tafshin Lamed Ches, the morning of Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe sent a message to Rabbi Tenenbaum, Rabbi Mendel Tenenbaum, who, as I told you before, was the Rebbe about the key. He blew the tekiahs of Musaf and after davening. And the Rebbe told him, I want you to stand next to me and I want you to be the Makri. So from Tafshin Lamed Ches, the Rebbe would stand on the left, Rabbi Tenenbaum would stand on the right, and he would point. So during the preparatory stuff before the Rebbe blew the tekiahs, Rabbi Tenenbaum was standing behind. Right behind the Rebbe, there was, to be on that bimah was by invitation only. The Rebbe's bimah by Tekiyas was only by invitation. And the Rebbe wanted Rosh Hashanah Yidin, Yidin who came from hard places. The Rebbe wanted people with Tzadahs to be on the bimah with him. Right behind the Rebbe was his secretaries. Behind that was whoever was invited. One of the groups of people who had the schus to be on the bimah with the Rebbe was all the Gaboyim. 770 had many Gaboyim. If you were a Gaba, you were entitled to be on the bimah during Tekiyas. Rabbi Tanabam was there. He stood behind the secretaries, behind Rabbi Groner, behind Rabbi Klein. I don't remember Rabbi Chadakov, but I'm assuming Rabbi Chadakov was there also. And when the Rebbe was about to blow, he would, the Rebbe would turn around and he would come forward. I think before the Rebbe made the brach, he would point with his finger. Now, in Tafshin and Beis, the year of 90, I was, the year of the stroke, that's what it is. I don't like to call it that, but that's what it is. There were a lot of Shinuyim by the Rebbe. A lot of things the Rebbe did were different. And one of the things that Rebbe did was different was as follows. Remember, the Rebbe is standing, here's the big Sefer Teda, here's the little Sefer Teda. The Rebbe stands here, Rabbi Tanamam stands here. So the Rebbe is to the left, Rabbi Tanamam is to the right. So normally when the Rebbe would turn around, he would turn this way and motion Rabbi Tanamam to come forward. In 1992, the Rebbe turned this way, to his left. And Rabbi Tanamam, I could see in my mind's eye, I remember this, understood that he belongs here and not here, but the Rebbe is inviting him to come here. So he started to bob, he started to like dodge the Rebbe. He wanted to... He wanted to let the Rebbe know that the Rebbe made a mistake. You know, the Rebbe turned the wrong way, but the Rebbe didn't make a mistake. So he went like this once or twice, and the Rebbe didn't turn around the other way. So Nun Beis, both days, the Rebbe stood on the right. It was a very visible Shina. The Rebbe stood on the right, and the Rebbe Tanamam stood on the left. And that Tishrei, there were many, many things that the Rebbe changed. And these are in Yonim that only a Rebbe understands. So he was the, the Makri. He would point with the finger when the Rebbe blew the tears. So the Rebbe finished the maftir. He would indicate this for the Sefer to come forward. And the Rebbe had on the bim a peklach. I told you the paper, I described this to you in the last class, these brown paper bags, these brown pieces of paper folded up and tied with a rope, the string in both directions. Now, in the years that I remember, there was always three. I looked up this morning, in the first years, there was two. And I read one year, there was four. So obviously, three was not mamish bediyuk. But what the Rebbe would do is, the three that I remember, he would make into an upside down segel, two underneath and one on top, at the top of the bimah. And then the Rebbe would throw his towels over his head, and you would see the Rebbe swaying back and forth, swaying back and forth. I, I looked up this morning in the regime, it says the Rebbe was swaying vigorously. The Rebbe was not swaying vigorously, he was swaying like this. <laughs> this is vigorous. <laughs> the Rebbe, was, the Rebbe was, didn't move a lot, so this was considered a lot. The Rebbe was swaying back and forth. So the whole towel like a tent. He doesn't have it on top. The whole task like a tent over the whole bimah. And the Rebbe is swaying back and forth. This is called hachonah letkiyas, the preparation for the tkiyas shayf. And apparently all the Rebbeim did it. When the Rebbe does hachonah letkiyas, we do nothing. There's nothing to do. People learn say mitilim if you want, but we just wait. In the earlier years when the crowd was smaller, hachonah letkiyas was very long. Could be even half an hour. People used to faint. It was gefelach. People used to faint. Um, in the years that I remember, the years that I remember, which means basically after my bar mitzvah, I don't think it was ever more than 10 minutes, maximum 15. They never cut it shorter. And the uh, people will tell you as if people understand, but the Rebbe was very sensitive to the fact that there were so many people, there was so much pushing, and people were fainting. And the Rebbe curtailed, the Rebbe cut himself back because the Rebbe was sensitive to the crowd. It is a fact, it's a fact, that all the Rebbeim were sensitive to the fact that there were people around them, even though the Rebbe was doing the holiest of things, and the people around him were one step lower than the holiest of things, the Rebbe was very, very sensitive to the crowd. I mean, one of the best examples for this is the Rebbe never, ever, finished Yom Kippur one minute late. Never. We finished on time. The Rebbe didn't, and he, he said, why? I don't want people to fast extra. I don't want to have it on his children. People should fast extra. So the, the later years, in Maine Yoren, the Hachon Litkiyas was shorter. What did the Rebbe do during Hachon Litkiyas? So there were a number of things that we know. Number one, 
The Rebbe sang a nigun. He hummed a nigun. But mamish, only the people closest, closest, closest to the Rebbe could hear the nigun. Rabbi Groner, who stood right behind the Rebbe, he, he would claim that he hears the nigun. And from what I understand, I don't know this for a fact, I don't know anything for a fact, but from what I understand, Rabbi Groda said the Rebbe would sing either the Nigid the Shalosh Tunus from the Baal of the Magid and Alter Rebbe, or there's a Chabad, there's a Nigid from Alter Rebbe, which the Alter Rebbe davened with on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, it's called a Chabad on Rosh Hashanah of Yom Kippur. It's a very a bitter Nigid Azad that the Alter Rebbe would hum, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and sometimes the Rebbe would sing that Tunua, the Chabad Tunua under the Talas. Another thing the Rebbe did under the Talis was that the second day of Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe said Yiske. Now, I don't know you, Kendalach. If there is in this room a Yisema, God forbid, a, do- a girl doesn't have a father or a mother, the Minik Chabad is the second day of Rosh Hashanah before Tkiyas, we say Yiske. Okay? It, this is what the Rebbe said. The Rebbe publicized it. So this becomes a Chabad custom. The Rebbe would say Yiske under the Talis the second day. Which means for all of us who have parents, Arich Yom B'Shanim Tevis, we say Avarachamim. Whenever the Olam says Yiskir, the people, we always go at a shul, people say Yiskir, but the people don't say Yiskir, we say Avarachamim. Avarachamim is that paragraph which we say every Shabbos before Ashrei. You don't say it when you don't say Tachnun. On days that people say Yiskir, they kick all of us, as the expression is, Allah kid and rice, all the kids that should go out. As long as you have parents, you're a kid. So you should say Avarachamim. The second day Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe said Yiskir under the Talas. So both so apparently you don't know. So Mitzvah Shevi should take you a very, very long time to find out. You say it for your father, for your mother, basically. And people already say Yiskir can say for a brother, for a sister. I and mean, after the Holocaust, people had Megillahs for Yiskir. Um, I was never in Shofar Yiskir. Baruch Hashem, I, I still, Baruch Hashem, have Gizun Tehei to have parents, father and mother. I want a white beard, but I'm a kind. I go out for Yiskir. Okay. And the Rebbe also did holy stuff. I, as a child, remember standing with my father in Shul, I must have been eight, hearing the Rebbe crying out loud, out loud, the Rebbe crying out loud for a long time. It may have been the year of the Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War started the Yom Kippur, the Shana was 10 days before. But I was a little kid and I knew that boys don't cry. You know? Your whole class picks on you, you're not allowed to cry. And here the Rebbe was crying in front of everybody, he wasn't even ashamed. I remember feeling embarrassed for the Rebbe, how come the Rebbe is not ashamed that he's crying? That's how much seichel I had. But I heard the Rebbe cry often call, but not every year. However, I heard from somebody who was on the bimmer that the Rebbe always cried before Tchias. It, it wasn't long enough, it wasn't loud enough, I didn't hear it, and I was, I was probably 20 feet from the bimmer and higher than the bimmer. I was in front of the bimmer. My father got us such good places, I, we could never possibly, we were so fortunate. Um, I saw Tchias so many times, I was very to see Tchias so many times. But I, I, only as a child I heard the Rebbe cry. Apparently the Rebbe always cried, but it was a little bit quieter. Another thing that happened under the talus was this. There is a process which is called mesadazain de shefres, arranging the shefres. This is a mystical thing which Rabbeim do. We don't do these things. We just come to show one shefres and you blow. The Rebbe had a whole series of say that how he was mesadazain de shefres. So of course the story was that in Tov Shin Yud Aleph, 1950 to 51, the Rebbe was not yet officially Rebbe, so the Baltake was better Rifkin. The one who blew shefres was the same person who blew shefres the Fiyadik Rebbe. There was nothing to talk about. But the following year, the Rebbe was already the Rebbe, the officially. So the Rebbe asked, who's going to blow Shefer? So the Chassidim said, the Rebbe's going to blow Shefer. The Rebbe said, but I don't know how to blow Shefer. And the Rebbe said, we're all the Rebbe blow Shefer. So the Rebbe said, okay, I'll be Masada the Sheferist, I'll arrange the Sheferist, and somebody else will blow. And the Rebbe sent a message, or he called Rabbi Mendel Tenenbaum, Oliver Sholem, and he asked him to be his Baal Take Care, yeah, that he should blow Shefer for the Rebbe, which he did. Rabbi Tenenbaum, the Rebbe had a stroke of Zion Adar. Rabbi Tenemam had a stroke of Zion Elul, the same year. In other words, he, his, he was the Rebbe's Baltakeya. As soon as the Rebbe was finished, he died. He, he, it's really eerie. He, they were making plans that he should blow Shefer Nun Gimel three days before Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi Tenemam had a stroke. Um, he was the Rebbe's Baltakeya. He blew Musaf, he blew after davening, and he stood next to the Rebbe by Tchias, as I'm going to describe to you uh, momentarily. So when the Rebbe agreed to blow Shefer, the Rebbe said, okay, bring me Sefer Rasichas Tav the Fiyadik Rebbe Sichas, where the Fiyadik Rebbe describes how the earlier Rebbe and Mumis had the Shefer. As if the Rebbe didn't know, you know, the Rebbe needed to look inside the book, he didn't know by heart, bring me the book, I'd look inside and see how you do it, this is all, I mean, the Rebbe knew exactly how to do these things, but uh, that's what the Rebbe did. Now, the way it goes, 
I looked it up this morning and I found contradictions, so I don't know how to do it. I'm going to tell you what I understand and I'm going to tell you what I remember, but evidently, at least some years I don't remember correctly. The Rebbe always had three shavers. And I don't know if I mentioned this previous class, as a child, the Rebbe used to use a very small black shafer. He would hold it in his hand, it would come out of this side two inches. It was a very small black shafer. The rumor was that it belonged to the Tzemach Tzedek. I'm assuming it was very hard to blow that shafer. It was a very small hole. The tone was a very high pitch, very high pitch. After my bar mitzvah, the Rebbe was using big shaferes, you know, beautiful, the kind of shaferes you could buy in the store. Uh, they were much easier to blow. And the story was two things. Number one, the shaver that the Rebbe used to blow became puzzle. They fixed it and they made it kosher, but the Rebbe didn't want to use it anyway. And the Rebbe said, Chaya Mushka, the Rebbe's wife, went to the store on Kingston Avenue, however she did it, and she said, give me the three easiest shafers you got. The easiest ones that could blow. The Rebbe's not part of the Rebbe's on the Rebbe. And they, she bought very easy shafers and she sent them to the mosquito and said, my husband's using these. <laughs> and my husband used these. So when I was a bacher, as a child, I remember this little black one, but as a bacher, the Rebbe used a larger shafer, and it was, it was, it was simply it was easier to blow. Um, and uh, that's what the Rebbe used. The Rebbe always had three shafers, and he always had two shmatas. And then I'll explain in a moment, he had a third. Shmata means a piece of cloth. Now, the, the story goes, that one of the Rabbeim, maybe it was the Rebbe Rashab, and maybe it wasn't Tafrei Samar Gimel, one of the Rabbeim had a dream, or some kind of a vision, where someone came to him from the other world and told him, do not give the Sutton notice that you're going to blow Shafer. Sutton doesn't need a heads up that you're going to blow Shafer. So from that time on, the Rabbeim used to be Masada the Shafer's under the talus. In other words, they would throw his talus over his head, and he'd be swaying back and forth, swaying back and forth. At some point, while he was under that talus, the Rebbe would arrange the Shafer's and nobody could see him. The second day is called Dina Rafia. The first day is called Dina Kashia, hard judgment. The second day is called Dina Rafia, soft judgment. On the second day, it doesn't matter if the Sutton knows because he's not so afraid of the Sutton. The second day, you would see the Rebbe being Masada the Shafiris. I saw it properly only once because in order to see the Rebbe being Masada the Shafiris, you had to be on the Rebbe's right and higher than the Rebbe. I was on the Rebbe's right, but I was in front. I was 20 feet, maybe eastward, or 15 feet eastward. One year, my brother-in-law, Zagazunzan, got me a very good place. I was mamish. I was on a bench, maybe 15 feet from the Rebbe, but directly to the Rebbe's right, and I was able to see exactly what the Rebbe was doing. I was only 60 years old, so exactly what did I understand? And frankly, when I'll be 60, I'll, I'll understand the same thing. Uh, but I saw the Rebbe in Masada the Shafers, and I'm going to tell you what I remember. Like I said, I made the mistake of looking it up this morning, and I found very different versions, but I'm going to tell you how I remember it. But remember again, the first day, when they picked up his head, the shavers were already, the package was already there. The second day, the Rebbe would pick up his talus, and you could watch the Rebbe being inside of the shavers. The Rebbe had a big white cloth. It was almost see-through, like a, like, a, like a modern Orthodox color veil. You know what I'm saying? You see through it. Um, and it was probably 20 inches. It was pretty large. And the Rebbe would stretch it out and make it very flat, very flat. On top of that, he had what was called a red kerchief. The red kerchief that I remember was not red. It was black with red flowers. And the Rebbe would, and it was much smaller. Maybe it was maybe 12 inches by 12 inches. It was considerably smaller than the white one. And he would also stretch it very flat. Then the Rebbe would put down the three shafers. And there was a way how he put the three shafers down. The narrow end was at the bottom. The wide end was at the top. But people knew he pointed this way, he pointed this way. I did not pay attention to that. Now, remember, the second day, Yom Tev, Rosh Hashanah, you have a problem with Shech Yanu. For the same reason that the second night, Rosh Hashanah, you make a Shech Yanu on a Pri Chodesh because it's, it's a, it's a, because it's a Yemarich, that you can't make two Shech Yanus. And by the way, I'm mentioning this to you because it's good to know. When you bench Lich the second night, Rosh Hashanah, the Shech Yanu fruit has to be on the table. Because your Shech Yanu, when you're benching Lich, is as much a Shaila as your father or your brothers or your husband's Shech Yanu when they're making Kiddush. Because the second day of Rosh Hashanah is considered one long day. So just like you have to have a Pri Chadash before Kiddush, when you say the Shech Yonu, you say the Shech Yonu on the Pri Chadash, when you're benching Licht, you should be, make sure that the new fruit is on the table before you bench Licht, and the Shech Yonu you have in Kavana also on the Pri Chadash. And the same is to Tkiyas. If you blow shave it both days, 
the second day shefer, the shachayonu, the second day is a shaila of a 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 and that white silk scarf was also in that package. So after the Rebbe laid down the white shefer, the tichel, and the so-called red tichel, which was black with red feathers, he put down the three shefers. That's how I remember it. And on top of that, he put the white kerchief. It was folded. Then he would close the red one, close the white one, like make it to a little package, turn the whole thing upside down, and press down. It was sort of appeared like a little peck of that package. Now, this is my recollections. And again, I don't say that what I recollect is true. This is how I remember it. What I find absolutely incredible is that black kerchief, the red, the black kerchief with the red feathers and flowers. I, I heard that it belonged to the Rebbe Marash. This morning I looked in the Yuman and said it belonged to the Alter Rebbe. So it, it was old. The first time I saw it, it was it was whole. It had a shape. The last time I saw it, I'll never forget it. You know what slinky is? What slinky is, yeah? I play the shachatz at payas, yeah. That's what it looked like. The, the shape had completely come apart. The kerchief had it didn't hold its shape anymore. It was so old, it was so worn out that you, you, you have an old piece of fabric, but it's a piece of fabric. This feet was so never so pathetically old that it just <laughs> I could see in my mind's eye. They picked it up, looked at it. I'm not going to say that ever smiled, but it was sort of like a sense of humor kind of moment. Just plop, he just dropped it. There was nothing, <laughs> there was no way he was going to stretch it out. So in the Yuman that I looked up this morning, he said that Rebbe had a second red one. I don't remember that, but this is, this is for sure. At the Rebbe, there was Nun Beis. They were picked it up, maybe it was an Alpha, looked at it, and in an ironic way, just dropped it. It was just nothing. It was just not, <laughs> it had no body. There was no way it could be stretched out. Then the Rebbe would fold the package and turn over. Now, I want to say one other thing now, which is Negea more to later, but I guess I might as well say it now. You must understand that I'm not telling you what happened. I am telling you what I observed. That's all it is. This is my experience. So I want to share with you how I remember it. Number one, during the Tkiyas, the Rebbe's face was visible. Again, I looked up at Yaman this morning, which the Rebbe's face was covered with a talus. That's not how I remember it. I looked up Yaman from different years. The, when I remember the Rebbe, here's the Rebbe's face, was, you see the Rebbe's face. The Rebbe looked totally composed. Totally composed. The feeling that I had looking at the Rebbe was, you know, like someone says, I got this, you know, I got this. It's, it's under control. The feeling that you had, that I had, was the Rebbe was completely in charge. Whatever he was doing, he got it. He was complete. That was the feeling that I had. Very, very composed. Very collected. Not nervous, not uptight, collected, and composed. His face, and again, this is just my experience, was pale, it wasn't fiery red, although I see many people writing that it was. His face was pale, with a little bit of color. And the countenance of the Rebbe, that combination, made you feel like the Rebbe was a million miles away. He was physically with you in the room, but he was in another universe. And that, that countenance, that look that you saw by Tchias was the same face you saw by Napoleon's march, when the towels would slide up over the Rebbe's face and you could see the Rebbe by Napoleon's march. Also, this very a pale with a little color and he just seemed, I'm using the word angel because I don't know what else to, where to use, he looked very far away. To contrast that to Simchas Teda, Simchas Teda, the Rebbe looked beautiful, he looked radiant, his face shone like the moon on a bright clear night. Lichtig, lichtig, beautiful, and radiant, and very close to you. Some chasteda, you felt like the Rebbe was close to you, even if there were thousands of people in the room. Tchias, when you stared near the Rebbe, his face was in another place. And his, his actions in the Tchias were very collected, very calm. But you saw nerves. <laughs> there were two places that you saw nerves. And that's why I'm telling this to you now. The first was how the Rebbe fixed his talus. Four times by Tchias, the Rebbe threw his towels over his head. Number one was called Hachon al which when the Rebbe did that, we just stood and waited. Then the Rebbe picked up his talus, and if it was the second day, he would be Masada the Shefris, like I just described. Every time the Rebbe fixed his talus, the, the, the physical gestures with his hands, and even the grimaces, his face, 
It was like as if he was fighting with the talus. And there was an agitation almost about how the Rebbe was fixing his talus and fixing his talus and fixing his talus. He did it four times. Once after Achon Latkias, once after Lam Nateach, once after the first 12 Kailis, when he says in the Siddur, the Yisvad de Balacha, you should confess silently, and once after the second nine Tkias, when it says again. And each time that was fixing, and the gestures, the, 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 the motions of his hand, and the grimaces on his face showed uh, a lot of impatience. You know, the talus was part of what was going on, but it was holding him back kind of thing. Um, and I remember one year, by the time the Rebbe was done, his talus had turned 90 degrees. There was such a fight with his talus. One year, when the Rebbe was finished, you know, the sides of the talus, you have black lines, right? And then there's like knots. One year, the black lines were across the Rebbe's forehead and the knots were hanging down. Because the Rebbe was so busy. And the talus was something that he had to just do. And you, you saw in the fixing the talus that whatever the Rebbe was busy with was terribly important. But his face, his countenance, was incredibly collected. This is one place where you saw the nervousness of Tkiyas. And the other was the shoifer. That was fighting with the shoifer. The sounds wouldn't come out. And every year was different. In the later years, by the time the middle mems came, by the time I was a boy of, let's say, 16, 17, or 18, it went like a whistle every year. It was so easy. Even in Bays, in Memchas, in Bays, it, just, it just went very easy. It just went, no problem. But as a child, I remember, and maybe even after my bar mitzvah, that means after Lamad Ches, that sometimes the Rebbe had a hard time blowing shefer. The Rebbe knew how to blow. The Rebbe used to blow shefer for himself every day in Elo. People would stand by the window and listen to the Rebbe blow shefer in his room. The Rebbe had no problems blowing shefer. The Rebbe was having a difficulty blowing shefer. It was obviously an Indian pnimi. It was something deeper that was going on. And the Rebbe was struggling. But what you saw the Rebbe do is the Rebbe had three shefer. He's holding one shefer. He takes his talus and he wipes out the mouthpiece to get the spittle out, the, the, whatever moisture is in. And he tries it once and he tries it twice. I don't remember this, but people describe it. They were putting down one shape and picking up another one, trying the other one back and forth. And there was a lot of a sense of, I guess you could say, frustration in the Rebbe trying to get the sounds out of the shoifer. Um, there was one year, way back when, before I was born, in Tovshin Yutes, from what I remember, 1958, where the Rebbe couldn't finish the Tkiyas Kayacho, the, the sounds wouldn't come out. So he handed the shefer to Mendel Tannenbaum, Rabbi Tannenbaum, Olav Shalom, and he finished. In Tafshir Lamed Vav, 1975, I was present. I was 10 years old. I was there, but I don't remember. I'd be alive if I told you I did. It took the Rebbe half an hour, half an hour, to get out the Tkiyah Gedoyla. But he didn't give away the shefer. He fought and he fought and he fought and he fought a half an hour to get out one sound. What things the Rebbe was pushing through is hard to know, but this is the Sipur that took the Rebbe very, very long to get a one sound. And when, the, when you watch the Rebbe cleaning the tip of the shoifer, the Rebbe never did this, you know, he didn't bag the shoifer in his hand, but you would watch him wipe the mouthpiece with his talus. You could see that he was trying to get it done and it wasn't happening. Now you must remember this, the Rebbe didn't have a tooth in his mouth. I remember the Rebbe's last tooth. I was before Bar Mitzvah when he lost that tooth. Before Bar Mitzvah. The Rebbe tried Katsenir. First, with people without teeth, their face looks disfigured. Unless you put indentures. The Rebbe didn't put indentures. The Rebbe didn't put indentures. The Friedrich Rebbe made conditions with his son-in-laws. If you want to marry my daughters, you have to do a few things. One of them is you have to know 500 Amari Hasidas by heart. And the other one is that you have to use dentures. The Rebbe didn't use any, any implants in his mouth. Kashas, Kashas. The Rebbe am very through my Kashas. The Rebbe didn't have a tooth in his mouth. He talked normal. He had a slight lisp, which is push it supernatural. It was one of those things that you saw all the time, you didn't realize it. The Rebbe's face should have looked shrunken. He should have looked sunken in like a newborn baby. Okay. The Rebbe's face looked normal. The Rebbe kept his jaw ajar all the time, deliberately, because he had no teeth. Your teeth keep your jaws from getting too close. The Rebbe didn't have teeth. Um, and Debbie spoke normally, and Debbie, it's impossible. To, if you have no teeth, you can't pucker your lips and blow. And the Debbie blew Shaifer on Zainid. And the other thing is, I recall distinctly the Debbie biting down on the Shaifer. Now, how do you blow a trumpet? Anybody play a flute or a trumpet or any real blue? You put it on your lip, right? And the whole trick is you have the muscles on your lips. A guy once explained to me that the muscles on the lips, you have to keep them strong, you have to exercise them, and if the muscles go wrong, you can't play your instrument. You put it on your lip. 
That was biting down. Ah, okay. Ah, I remember them biting down on the shafer. The shafers that they now have, that they never used, have blood on them. Now, I don't know if this was always, but certainly on occasion, they would put the shafer in his mouth and blew, which is not possible. Forget the teeth. He didn't put it on his lips, he put it in his mouth. I could see in my mind, I remember it. They were biting down on the shafer, like this. And he was going to blow with the shafer in his mouth. I don't know how you do that. So there were things about, there were things about the Rebbe Sanhoge that were normal, everyday things. They were really so extraordinary. They were so extraordinary, but we took it for granted. Yeah. But it, no human being, physical things that the Rebbe did, especially in the later years of the Rebbe's life when the Rebbe's body was elderly, that are not physically possible. That was such a balabais over his goof, it was extraordinary. Um, but the Rebbe managed to blow a shaver without teeth, and again, at least one occasion, possibly more, the Rebbe didn't put the shaver on his lips, he put the shaver in his mouth, which I don't know how you blow like that. Okay? So that's a little bit about the Arum Bimizokt. But the, the place, these are the two places where you saw the Rebbe's intensity was in how he was fixing the talus over and over again, and how he was fighting with the shaver to get the shaver to let him make the, to blow the tkiyas. So the Rebbe did what's called hachon al He would throw his towels over his head, and you would see him swaying back and forth, not vigorously, in spite of what it says in the Yumanim that I saw this morning, like this, like this. The whole, the whole, like it was a mountain, was moving back and forth. The first day when he picked it up, the shaver was ready. The second day, the Rebbe would straighten beside the shavers as I described before. Mm-hmm. Then the Rebbe would take the edges of his talus and put them behind his ears like this here, and hold it up like this. And then he would say, Lam na te yach livne koi rach mizmer. Or once in a while, Lam na te yach livne koi rach mizmer. And throw the talus back. And now we were busy. The whole shul said, Kapitel mem zain. It's not a very long kapitel. Seven times. The Rebbe always took longer. The Rebbe bechal david very quick. You could have said, Lam na 14 times. The Rebbe took his time. The Lam na took a long time. And then the talus came up again. And again, fixing the talus, fixing the talus, fixing the talus. And then the Rebbe said eight psukim, right? There's eight psukim. The first pasuk is menametar. The last pasuk is Allah likim bisru. And in between you have ku fresh ayin shin tof nun tes nun kra sotan, right? Keli shima reish devar cha emes arev. Right? There's eight psukim, and the Rebbe would sing each one of the psukim in a very, he says, in a very normal voice, not a high voice. He wasn't in a very normal voice, and there was shinuyim. There was a standard Nusach the Rebbe sang it, but every Pasek was a little bit different. They were saying all eight Psukim. I am not comfortable singing it here, and I'm certainly not comfortable singing each Pasek twice, because I can remember almost each Pasek the Rebbe made Shinoyim. I'm just going to share with you one experience, which I'll never forget. Um, the year the Rebbe passed away, Tov Shin Memches. There were a lot of Shinoyim that year also. One of the psukim is Arev Avdo Chalotev Al Yashkuni Zeder. And the way that I used to sing it normally was Arev Avdo Chalotev, or sometimes Arev Avdo Chalotev. And then he would sing Al Yashkuni Zeder. That's how the Rebbe sang it. In Tovshim Amchas, the Rebbe sang Al Yashkuni Zeder. Both days. But the first day, when the Rebbe said Al, the first day Rosh Hashanah Tovshim Amchas, it came out in a cry. A cry. The whole thing was a half a second. But it was a cry of, you know, when you read in holy books, Agishreif and Yechidesh Abenefesh, I heard how that sounds. The best chazan in the world, the most talented singer, cannot sing how that sounded. And it was so fast. And it was, it just kept on going. You know, they didn't cry and say, okay, I gotta get tissues. It just kept moving. Ah, the hour was Agishrei. It was a cry. For Mama Shomitsa Nefesh. These, you know, by the Rebbe, they would have, things would happen like this from time to time, and you didn't know what to think. Okay, that's how you can sit. Go ahead. It's fine. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Of course. Um, but it, it, these things, you couldn't control the Rebbe. You know, you didn't want the Rebbe to do these kinds of things, because you knew they have meaning, and the meaning was very painful. But the Rebbe did what he had to do, but it was so fast. You could forget it. Ah, that owl. I, I'll never forget the owl. And I've looked at many Rishimis. A lot of people didn't even hear it. They didn't even register. It was like, Gishrei, Yechidisha Benefesh. The first day. The second day he did it the same way. But second way he just sang it. There was no cry. And there was all these kinds of things. When the Rebbe said the Psukim, there were all kinds of these Shinoyim. Then there's a Nusach that you read a few lines, a kind of a, a Yehiratzen. 
And then the Rebbe made the bracha. Baruch atah adishem elikeinu melech ha'olam asher kiddishonu b'mitzvei savitivonu lishmei yakel sheifar. And which came, Amen. And the Rebbe said, Shekhyanu, both days. And then the Rebbe tore open the package, tore it open, pulled out the sheifar, and he started to blow. So this morning I looked up the Yuman, and it says that in the first year, the Rebbe made the brachas. The Rebbe wanted Tenenbaum to make the brachas, and the Rebbe just made believe that he doesn't know what the Rebbe wants. The Rebbe made the brachas, and the Rebbe handed the shefer to Tenenbaum to blow. The second year, the Rebbe made the brachas, that means Yud Gimel, and he blew the first sound. The third year, maybe the Rebbe blew Tashat. It took a few years, two, three, four, or five years. My father's first recollection of Tchias was Yudalid, was the third year, and the Rebbe did not blow all the 30 caliphs, he just blew a few of them. But within five or six years, the Rebbe blew all the, all the tkiyas in the But in the very beginning, again, what I saw this morning was that the first year, the Rebbe didn't even blow one sound. I remember saying that the first year he blew one sound, but I'm going to trust what I saw in a book this morning that was written at the time, rather than what my memory is telling me. The second year, Yud Gimel, the Rebbe blew the first kiyah, he gave it to Tanabah, he blew the shayfer. In the beginning with the third year, the Rebbe blew a little more, a little more, till the Rebbe did all 30 kailas. Now, again, every year is different. The last year is Mamish, Nunalif, Nunbei, that Kiyas was easy and quick. The truest was short, everything was very quick. But in the middle of Mems, my Bacharim she years, the Rebbe had a pretty easy time long Shafer, do I remember it? And the Kiyas was very long. The minig is that the Tkia in the beginning is supposed to be as long as the Shvarim, the Tru, and the Tkia that comes after it. Or Faket, the Tkia after, I forgot which. One, either the Tkia before, the Tkia has to be as long as the Tkia, the Shvarim, through. So the Rebbe's case was very long. The Rebbe moved very long through us, very long through us. A lot, a lot, a lot of through us. And I'm just going to share a couple of details, technical details. You know how the Rebbe blew a Shvarim, right? It was very unique. The Rebbe Shvarim was Tuhutu, Tuhutu, Tuhutu. And sometimes it was Tuhutu, 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 Tuhutu. There was a couple of extra sounds which people are denying, but there's no doubt that the Rebbe did it. This is a halacha thing. When, the, when you blow Shvarim, there's a Shaila, if the Shvarim through it should be one sound or two. So the Pshara is that the Tkiyas Meyushev, the sound that the Rebbe blew, the, tru, the shvarim goes straight into two. It's one sound. Two, 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 two. During Shmanesre and during Chazar Sashat and in Kaddish and then after Tilim, the Baltakeya blows two, 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 when he stops and he breathes and then he says two, 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 two. So when the Rebbe blew Shoifar, the shvarim and the Tru went in one breath. He didn't stop. And the other thing is the Rebbe, most people blow through is very quick. Two, 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 two. It's just easier. The Rebbe's truas were quite slow. Two, 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 and there could have been a hundred of them. It went on and on. It wasn't a hundred, but it was so long. Each trua, so you have the shvarim, which is short, then the long truas, and the Rebbe did this three times. And then when the Rebbe finished those, and like I said to you before, after Lama Ches, Rabbi Tenemon stood to the Rebbe's right, he pointed. As soon as the Rebbe finished the first 12, the Rebbe throws the towels over his head, and the same thing, you see the whole mountain swaying back and forth. This was rather quick. Then the towels came up, it was straight in the towels, straight in the towels, straight in the towels. And he blew nine more. Tchia, Shvarim, Tchia. And then after that, he threw the towels back. It was the fourth time. And you would see the towels swaying back and forth. Also, the Misvad de Balachash was usually short. Picked up his towels, straightened it, straightened it, straightened it, and he blew the last nine. Tchia, Trua, Tchia. As soon as they ever finish one tkiyas, there's a, again a Yehiratsan that you read a few lines. And then you never would say three psukkim. There were three psukkim afterwards. The, these three psukkim that ever used to say in a crescendo, meaning each later postic was a higher tone. The first postic, the would push it sing. He would sing it like a melody. The Rebbe Rashab used to sing all three psukim. The Rebbe didn't sing. The second pasuk and the third, but the Rebbe would say it with a trap. B'shem cha, it was a higher tone. B'shem cha, yegilon. And the third pasuk, the Rebbe would shout. Kisif eres In other words, each one of these three last psukim was a crescendo, a higher tone. And as soon as the three psukim were finished, ashrei yeshu and everybody relaxes. 
And as soon as everybody relaxed, you would literally see the aid yalam and aretz. You see a vapor, a cloud of vapor, slowly climbing up to the ceiling from the perspiration. And during Musaf, it was seven seventy was irrigated. Um, the Rebbe would take the shayfiris in his right hand and take the two or three sedurim, which I talked to you about yesterday, in his left hand. I talked about the sedurim yesterday, right? Yeah. And he would follow the sefetera. Normally, when the Rebbe went to an aliyah, he came this way and he went back this way. But on Yom Tif, that there's no you can pork on, so the Rebbe would follow the sefetera. So the Rebbe would go this way and go back the same way. So the sefetera went ahead of the Rebbe. And this was one of the big fights in 770. Chavir rushed to kiss the sefetera and they get out of the way. The Rebbe's right behind. He's holding the shefiris with the cloths in his right hand, the sedudim in his left hand, and behind him is walking the mosquitoes. Again, I don't remember Chavakov. I'm assuming he was there. And Label and Binyam and Aleya and Hashem were holding the peklach. By the way, I want to say one little detail. The Rebbe never took his towels off his head. The Rebbe never took his towels off his head. By the earlier Rabbeim, there was a, a tkufa in each tefillah. By Kaveh, the Rebbe Hashem took his towels off his head. The Rebbe never took his towels off his head, except Masiyam Kippur, which I'll tell you about next time. So the Rebbe has a scarf. Right, which he used in the tkiyas. So after the tkiyas, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe didn't take his talus off. He kept his talus on. He would take the edge of the scarf, push it in here, and pull it out like this here. So without taking his talus off, and the whole Musaf, the Rebbe wore that scarf. It was a silk scarf. When the Rebbe walked out, you could see the Rebbe wearing the scarf. And then it went away for Kala veils. That was the last time the Rebbe used it. Kalas got to use it after that. And the Rebbe would follow the Sefer back to his place. He put the shavers in the bima, in the omid, and the siduram on top, the peklach one on the table, and the chazan is signed to pay for musaf. While the chazan, pay for musaf, the Rebbe fixes his talus now proper. He straightens his whole talus. And when the Rebbe finished straightening his whole talus, the Rebbe would make a 360. You know what a 360 means? A complete revolution, a complete three, all the way around. It says in Svarim, I don't know which, but it says in Svarim, that after Tkiyas, it's a minic to look at the face of the Baltikeya. It's a school of I don't know what. So, when the Rebbe finished blowing Shafe, he went back to his place. The Rebbe would turn around 360 degrees, a complete circle. Okay, now, but so Weinberg, Yasser Weinberg told me, he was on Friedrich and Rebbe. The Friedrich and Rebbe didn't have this many people. The Friedrich and Rebbe, after he did Tkiyas, would physically turn his chair around, sit on his chair, facing the crowd, and look at everybody. But Ava the Chibbe Bashit. I mean, you didn't know Weinberg, right? He was such a beautiful man. With so much love. They would look at the Elam. Just look at everybody. Look at a face full of love. The Rebbe did everything at supersonic speed. That was the Rebbe's operation. So the Rebbe would turn around. He faced the wall. He would hold up the edge of the task and very slowly, slower than this, make a complete circle. 360. Somebody told me, and I don't remember this, but somebody told me that in Nun Bays, they made a complete circle this way, and then he circled around this way. He did it twice. I, I, I was there, and if it happened, I saw it, but I'm not going to lie to you. I don't remember it. Somebody told me, and it's a somebody that I actually believe that this actually occurred. And that was Tkiyas. That was Musif. The Rebbe used to give Tanabama Shafer. But Klal and Elul, the Rebbe used to give Tanabama Shafer to practice. And the Rebbe gave him a Shafer, and every Tanabama blew Musif. Every Tanabama never had any blessed Sultan, never gotten Tanabama Shafer, Tanabama no problem, Shafer. And Musaf was Musaf, and the Shtulish Mesah, Hekish Mesah, the only feature that my Musaf, Rosh Hashanah, was Kairim. And I'll tell you how it was. The Rebbe would fall to the ground. Kairim, you bow down. Yim Kippur, you bow down four times. Rosh Hashanah, you bow down once. So what would happen is, the Bochem are climbing up, they just look at the Rebbe falling down, and the old people are screaming at the Bochem, a chutzpah, the Rebbe is falling to the ground, and you're looking at him. So this was the, the war of the ages. The older people were saying, it's not respectful, the Rebbe's doing Kairim, you should look at him, and we wanted to see. It was nothing to see. <laughs> The Rebbe used to fall to the knees and hit the floor. He did it in one motion. In other words, the Rebbe didn't use his hands. It would fall to the ground. Even when the Rebbe was older, he didn't get down using his hands. He would fall on his knees and fall forward in one motion. And when he got up, he would hold on to his chair. He would help himself get up. Nobody helped the Rebbe in public. Um, but when the Rebbe did kite him, he would fall. He, he would just drop to his knees and fall forward in one motion. And then he would get up. This was by Aleinu. This was kite him. Now, of course, you probably know that when the Rebbe went to the the Rebbe went away from his place. The Koinim stood on the Rebbe's platform. And the Rebbe would go stand at the bottom of the platform. So Rosh Hashanah also, towards the end of Musaf, the Rebbe would go off his place, come down on the bottom, they appeared another place for the Rebbe. The Koinim all went on the Rebbe's platform and near the Rebbe's platform. And the Rebbe stood on the bottom. And after Musaf and after Kaddish, 
the Koyanim would come down and the Rebbe used to say to every single Koyan, separately, Ayashakeh Koyan. In other words, it took a time, it took a while because the Rebbe, each Koyan went, and the Rebbe said to every single Koyan who was on the Bimah, as they would pass down coming down the steps, each Koyan, Ayashakeh Koyan, then they went back to his place and till him and the other Musaf. The other thing that happened Hashanah was Tashlich, right? And this is the different, the Tashlich is a Tashlich is a long story. Tashlich is a long story. The Rebbe got here in Sivan Tav right, in May of 1941. The Rebbe Rayat had been in 770 by then for 10 months. He was been in 770 Rashana before. So when it came to Rashana Tav is the following Rosh Hashanah, the Chesidim who had been there the year before knew already how Tashlich is, and the Rebbe Kvayachal didn't know how Tashlich was. So the famous story that Zalman Posner tells, you have to hear him tell the story, it's beautiful, that the Rebbe asked, is there a place to do Tashlich? Because very, very often, um, in a big city, there's no lakes. In a shtetl, shtetlach are all built on rivers and lakes. That's why they have them, because they need fresh water. If no water, you can't live. For transportation, for food, for irrigation, for drinking. But in the big city, we have pipes, plumbing. It's possible that there's no lake. So a lot of people live in places in New York City where you can't do Tashlich unless you want to walk five miles. So then you do it, you go, do you find a lake with fresh water where there's fish, and you go and say Tashlich. So the Rebbe asked, is there a place to do Tashlich? And they told the Rebbe, a mile from 770 is Botanical Gardens. It's still there. And the Botanical Gardens has an entrance in Eastern Parkway. It has an entrance and also an empire in Eastern Parkway. And the Rebbe would go in and he'd go over to the lake and say Tashlich. The Botanical Garden was aware that the from a Yidna coming, the first day on say Tashlich. So they wouldn't close at 5 o'clock. They stayed open until like 7. So that everybody could come and do Tashlich. And of course the story was that the Rebbe said that they should go in pairs. They should march like soldiers and sing an igmu. So the Rebbe was in the front row with Chadakov and the Rebbe walked fast. And the whole island marched. It wasn't like a, it wasn't just a hodgepodge. You were marching like soldiers, singing. And the whole of Khan Heights was full of Jews. Most of them not from conservative, reform. They were very Jewish. They weren't very frum, but they were very Jewish. They were all in temple that day, so they all came out to watch a spectacle. It was an unbelievable experience. The chassidim singing and thousands of people watching them. The first few years, we looked like weirdos, but over time, it became traditional. They waited for the Rebbe to go to Tashlech. And the Rebbe is going to Tashlech lasted 25 years, till the mid-60s. Way after he became a Rebbe, the Rebbe used to walk to Tashlech. The last time the Rebbe came to Tashlich, I'm assuming it was Chava, but I'm not sure. That means 65 to 66. The Rebbe comes to the lake. My father told this to me. There was a row of photographers. Click, 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 click. The Rebbe became too famous, you understand? So the Rebbe said, I'm not going to go next year. They take pictures of the Rebbe on Yom Tif. I'm not going to go next year, even if it means that I can't do Tashlich. On Rosh Hashanah, I'll go during Aser Asi The Rebbe no longer went. And they found, uh, they found, they found a, a spring under 770, and they dug it up, and we had Tashlich for 770. 